Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and thank you so much for joining us for uh, this afternoon's session. Um, I'm Sam Peck. I'm the Executive Director of Family Councils of Ontario, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's event. Uh, it's part of our June 2022 virtual conference, Regroup, Refocus, Recharge. Uh, we're marking Seniors Month and Family Council Week, amongst other celebrations, uh, with an incredible lineup of speakers, including today's speaker, Dr. Samir Sinha. Uh, before we go any further, I just want to take a moment to, uh, in the spirit of reconciliation, acknowledge the land I'm coming to you from today. I'm based in Hamilton and that is situated upon the traditional territories of the Erie, Neutral, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Mississaugas. FCO is an entirely remote team uh, with staff spread across the province. And we encourage our team members, our service users, um, our partners, really everyone that we interact with to really reflect on colonialism's enduring legacy and engage in meaningful reconciliation. We encourage everyone to visit a really great website, that's native-land.ca, to learn more about uh, the territory your home situated on. As it is, as it is Indigenous, Hist Indigenous History Month as well, we hope you'll mark the month by learning more about the Indigenous peoples of your community and their history. The work non-Indigenous organizations and individuals like myself, like FCO, need to do towards reconciliation with Indigenous peoples and communities is a long-term journey, specific to each individual, and it's constantly evolving for our organization. And we welcome you to join us on our journey. Uh, I was actually at a great community event on the weekend and was able to buy a pair of amazing beaded earrings from a local Indigenous artisan. And so I'm happy to uh, be wearing these uh, today. So it's Seniors Month. It's Family Council Week, was last week. We're holding education and networking sessions all month. We're trying something new this year, and we're glad you're along for the ride. Tomorrow is our one day conference event with three guest speakers, structured networking opportunities, and tons of opportunities to connect with your peers. So we invite you to join us for those incredible learning and networking opportunities. But now it is my sincere pleasure to introduce today's guest speaker. Dr. Samir Sinha will speak about the future of long-term care. Uh, he's a man who doesn't need much of an introduction. I'm sure that you're familiar with him, having seen or read about him in the news. Uh, Dr. Sinha is a passionate and respected advocate for the needs of older adults. Uh, he, his bio, would, reading out in full, would take some time, but uh, he currently serves as the Director of Geriatrics at Mount Sinai and the University Health Network Hospitals in Toronto. In 2012, he was appointed by the Government of Ontario to serve as the expert lead of Ontario's senior strategy. He's also an assistant professor in the Departments of Medicine, Health Policy, Management and Evaluation at University of Toronto and an assistant professor of medicine at the John Hopkins University School of Medicine. So uh, we'll be posting, we're posing questions at the end. So throughout the session, enter your questions into the house space chat. Now, without any further ado, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Samir Sinha to the virtual stage. Dr. Sinha, over to you. Thanks so much, Samantha. And uh, thanks for having me as a member of, uh, of the team presenting um, uh, over, the, uh, over the coming weeks. And, uh, uh, it's a real honor to be here today, and uh, uh, I've prepared a little presentation um, that can really help guide uh, some of our session today. Just really talking about this topic of, you know, what can the future of long-term care look like? What are the things that we should be thinking about, um, especially from um, the perspective of so many family caregivers, but other um, allies and friends who are watching here today? So I'm going to rely on our, our, our tech savvy. Uh, there we go. Uh, Dinesh, um, who's uh, who's helping us keep things on track here. So this is perfect, and I'm going to assume that I'm just going to be able to advance my slides um, 
by hopefully, yes, I see that I can do next slide. So I think I'm good to go. So thank you, team. Uh, so I just want to share with you a little bit about how I'm thinking about the future of long-term care, because I think over the last two years in particular, this pandemic has really um, made us really rethink how we are envisioning long-term care across the country. Um, what have we done well? What do we need to do better? And I just want to say a shout out to, um, to Sam um, and her team at FCO. Um, I think, you know, we've we've always valued the role that the family councils of Ontario have played um, for many years now, but in particular during the pandemic, when we saw, when people started realizing the true value of family caregivers, especially when they were shut out of our long-term care homes. Um, I know Samantha and, 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 and other members of her team were doing an incredible amount of work, um, really making sure that the family caregiver voice was understood, was recognized, um, and was supported so that we could really ensure that the health system truly appreciated the value the family caregivers play um, and their essential role truly um, in our long-term care system as well, but in all parts of our healthcare system. So I just want to say thank you, um, and you'll see a little bit of that reflected in some of my comments today. So I have three objectives today. I want to really help us to appreciate how the pandemic and our experiences have really influenced our views on what long-term care might need to look like across Canada. I want us to appreciate how aging in the right place needs to begin with the development of age-friendly communities, but also be supported with new national long-term care standards. Um, and also provide you with some insights that can make, uh, that can help enable Canadian models of long-term care that make sense. So we know that our experiences often shape our perspectives. And for many older Canadians, accessing long-term care usually means having to leave one's own home or community. We have to remember that, that, that when a person, um, an older person is living um, in their communities, they're, they're not just living on their own. They're often living with family members and friends. They're often living in communities and neighborhoods that they've come to know for many years over time. And when one leaves one's community, whatever they might define that as, and, and, and go into a home, for example, it can be even more challenging, especially when one may not be able to receive culturally safe and appropriate care um, and be as close to family members and friends. And, and that can really be a challenge. We also know there exists this, uh, this universal desire to age in place amongst most older, older Canadians. Um, and again, we often struggle to enable this. And so how do we actually support this where possible, but also recognizing the value that long-term care homes play uh, and, and need to play in providing care for those who may need um, to be in a long-term care home. We also know that COVID-19 has shifted our perspective significantly. We know that right now, 97% of older Ontarians believe there's a crisis in long-term care. We know that 78% of Ontarians rather receive home care for themselves and their loved ones over care in a long-term care home. We know that during the pandemic, 60% and almost 70% of older Canadians in particular said that they changed their minds, their opinions on whether they'd arrange for themselves or a loved one um, to live in a nursing or retirement home. And we know that 57% of Ontarians do not believe that they'll have access to good quality long-term care when they'll need it. These are quite sobering statistics, and I think it really has shown how much this pandemic has really focused our attention around long-term care and what we need to do to better support people living in these settings. And we also know that we have to really um, respect our realities because uh, we know that uh, we often take a look at things with an urban lens, um, but we can't do that in places like Ontario where large parts of our population are maybe living in small and remote um, uh, areas um, of the province. And sometimes these are parts of the province that don't support um, services or healthcare economies of scale, meaning that um, 
the challenge is, is that sometimes the community is too small to be able to support a long-term care home, for example. So it ultimately means that a person to receive long-term care must actually leave their community. And some of my patients that I've had up on the James Bay Coast, that meant having to go all the way down to Timmins or Cochrane, uh, really hours away from family members and friends, which can be really devastating. And as long as we keep looking at rural problems with urban solutions, we're going to miss the opportunities that exist to actually figure out what type of long-term care solutions make sense wherever a person may be living. And this is one of my patients, former patients, um, up in uh, um, uh, along the James Bay Coastal Nations. And this is in, in Moosinee, Moose Factory. This is Granny Wabanau, um, who was our oldest participant um, in our senior strategy consultations in 2012. Um, and she lived till the age of 109 years of age. She also happened to be the oldest residential school survivor in Canada at the time when Prime Minister Harper made the official apology and, and he made it to her on the floor of the House of Commons. So an incredible woman with an incredible legacy as well. But when I asked her what was most important for her, she said she never wanted to leave the community that she was in. She wanted to stay there for as long as possible. And that's what every older person I talked to said. They want to remain in their own communities for as long as possible. But if they needed long-term care, they wanted good, high-quality long-term care to be them, for them and their families. So how do we enable the future of long-term care in Canada? What are the things we need to look at overall? So this is a, a series of reports that we produced through our National Instant on Aging. And we really focused on, on these ideas or the overall um, a philosophy of the the of, of a national senior strategy the idea that we need to have one of these in Canada because we don't we currently don't have a government-led national senior strategy but when we've done our work that dates back um, oh my goodness almost 10 years now we know that there are four key overarching things that Canadians tell us they value as they age you know that people want to remain independent productive and engaged citizens for as long as possible people want to lead healthy and active lives People want to receive care closer to home whenever possible. And we also have to recognize the importance of our family caregivers. Over 8.1 million Canadians are providing uh, care to another family member or friend. So we have, to recommend, we have to recognize those individuals, especially when so many people living in our long-term care homes as well often have family caregivers as well who are deeply involved in their care. So back in 2019, a year before the pandemic, we actually embarked as an institute to do a wholesale review of long-term care in Canada. And we had two groundbreaking reports at that time. Number one was enabling the future provision of long-term care in Canada. And then another one looking at the future costs of long-term care in Canada, and also looking at the role of family caregivers. And I'll share with you some of the results from this as well. So when we talk about long-term care, often if you're in a place like Ontario, we often use the term long-term care to refer principally to the idea of nursing homes. But if you actually go around the world, if you go to most European countries, if you go to the United States, for example, long-term care really focuses on a much broader definition. And so we comb the world looking for various definitions and we actually came up with our own in Canada that builds on some of the best definitions from around the world. And so what we talk about is when we think about long-term care, we need to think about a few different ideas. One is the types of support, first of all. So we talk about ADL or IADL supports. ADL stands for activities of daily living. IADL stands for instrumental activities of daily living. ADLs are things like toileting, um, transferring, um, bathing, dressing, feeding oneself, just walking around. IADLs are those higher order tasks like taking one's medications, preparing a meal, doing one's finances. And so we know these are types of, of supports that people might increasingly need as they grow older. And these might be provided to them either by paid care providers, whether it be a home care provider or a provider in a long-term care home, or by unpaid caregivers, such as family caregivers. We also know that this care can often be provided either in a home and community-based setting or in a designated um, um, institutional setting like um, a long-term care home. And so it can be provided in a variety of locations as well. Um, and it, the care can also be both preventative and responsive. So responsive by saying that if someone now needs help with a bath, for example, we'll provide them that support taking a bath. 
preventative really focuses on things that we can do to maybe help people keep their strength and their balance so that they won't need help getting a bath or even sometimes where you can recover that strength um, and, uh, and uh, recover that decline that you might have had through something that we call reablement as well. So again, these are the types of things that we think about. And when you start thinking about this, uh, people remind me that um, often people can be provided care by their family caregivers and, and, and the home care system. They can receive long-term care in their own homes, but some people need to receive long-term care in a long-term care home. So there's a variety of settings where this can be provided. But when we think about long-term care, <coughs> really across the continuum as a spectrum, I think it really helps us better contextualize um, the realities of where long-term care can be provided. So why does long-term care matter? Well, first of all, it's the largest form of hands-on care that's not covered under the Canada Health Act. And we know that right now, when you look at um, what services are covered, for example, in Ontario versus Manitoba versus Quebec, we know coverage levels and qualifying criteria and even design standards actually vary significantly across provinces and territories. We know there's also a growing value of these services to meet the long-term care needs of an aging population effectively and sustainably. And we also know that the current demand for long-term care services is already unprecedented and only expected to grow as the population ages. And right now we know, especially from a report back in 2019, that the system's been plagued by long-standing systemic vulnerabilities when it comes to its health human resources and physical design um, standards as well. So we know that long-term care matters because even well before the pandemic in 2015, there was a survey of 2008 Canadians that was done and found that 63% of respondents said that their family was not in a good position financially or otherwise. So they might not have had the finances, the dollars, or they might not just have had enough um, time and support and available family members available to provide care um, for their older family members. And this really worried them greatly. So you can imagine the stress that's on so many families thinking if mom or dad needs more care, if my brother or sister needs more care, or my spouse needs more care, I don't know how we're gonna do it. I don't know if we can afford um, private home care, for example. I don't know if we can provide, um, if we'll, you know, it's just me. I don't have other family members or friends we can rely upon um, to provide that extra care and support. So this creates a huge amount of stress for folks uh, when they realize how unprepared they might be uh, for meeting the long-term care needs of their loved ones as well. And we know that currently over 430,000 Canadians tell us they have unmet home care needs. This is from a, a surveys done by Stats Canada um, that really showed that of those who are receiving um, 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 care, we know that a number of them report having unmet needs and so many others who say they just don't even have any care to begin with. And we know that this was back in 2019, over 40,000 Canadians were on nursing home wait lists. Our parliamentary budget office now tells us it's over 52,000 Canadians who are on nursing home wait lists, really drawn um, and spurred on even further by the pandemic itself. So where does Canada stand when it ranks against other international countries? Well, this is some data that we've we put together um, through the OECD, which is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And it really uh, compares Canada to other nations. And really what I want you to what what I want you to appreciate here is you'll see this list of countries and you'll see um, Canada denoted by a maple leaf um, symbol, um, you know, uh, 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 there. Um, and so when you see Canada in terms of how much it spends of its gross domestic product, it's about 1.2%. And what I want you to compare that to is something called OECD 15. So that's towards the left uh, hand side, where it basically says that right now, um, we spend about 30% less of our funding um, on long-term care services compared to the average OECD country. So the average industrial country spends 30% more on long-term care services, and we spend about half of what Denmark spends um, on providing long-term care services to our population. So that's the first slide I want to show you. 
Here's the next slide I want to show you. It basically shows how we actually spend our long-term care dollars. So if you look towards the left hand of your screen, you'll see that maple leaf there showing Canada. And it shows that in 2015, if you will, 87 cents on every dollar that we were spending of our long-term care dollars was being spent on care in, in nursing homes um, and only about 13% on the provision of home and community care. If you go towards the middle, so if you start heading towards the right, you'll see something saying OECD 26, and it shows that the average industrialized country spends a lot higher percentage of its funding on providing home and community care services um, and about 65% of its funding on nursing home care. But again, if you focus towards third from the right, you'll see Denmark over there, where they spend two thirds of their funding on the provision of home and community care, where we spend about a third, where they spend about a third of their funding on the provision of long-term care services. So really different ways of approaching long-term care spending. But what I really want you to take away from these two slides is the fact that Canada spends a lot less than the average international country does on the provision of long-term care. And we tend to spend the majority of our dollars on caring for people in long-term care homes rather than their own homes and community. And as many of us are also well aware, we don't adequately fund our long-term care home system well enough um, with enough staffing to provide the essential care. It's why family caregivers become so essential in these settings, because without them, we know that many people would go without the levels of care they depend on and need as well. We also know that when we look at the future costs of long-term care, this is that second report we did, we know that the costs of, of providing public care in nursing homes and in people's own homes is gonna more than triple um, in terms of caring for the older population in Canada from 22 billion to 71 billion um, between 2019 and 2050. We also know that when people say, well, we'll just rely on family caregivers to pick up the slack because we can't afford uh, 70 something billion dollars. So we'll just lean on families even more um, to provide more care. But we also know that with declining birth rates and, and changing geographies of families and friends, there's gonna be 30% fewer close family members available to provide unpaid care to other, um, to older Canadians as we age. And so we can't simply rely on family caregivers because we also know um, that in order uh, for, if people are dependent on family caregivers to provide that unpaid care that they'll need, with 30% fewer availables, available family caregivers, it means that the remaining caregivers are gonna have to increase their uh, amount of, um, of efforts by about 40% to continue providing the same amount of family care um, that's currently being provided today. So that's not a sustainable option either. So, but it's important to acknowledge that and acknowledge already how much support family caregivers are providing and how they're not gonna be the answer alone um, towards continuing to meet the needs of our aging population. So we have to think harder and do better. <clears throat> so when we think about a conceptual framework for thinking about the future of long-term care in Canada, this is a really complicated um, diagram um, and I don't have time to go through it in detail. But again, if you look at our report that's freely available online, you can see how we've outlined basically what that care can look like over time. And we really talk about things that we can do in a, in a variety of ways. So along the left-hand column or the left-hand side in the purple, you'll see that where we talk about um, healthy older adults all the way to people who have quite significant complex health and, 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 uh, and social needs, for example. Um, and then on the, on, on the right-hand side, you'll see, for example, um, different environments where people might be living. So they might be living independently in their own homes towards the bottom, all the way to the top where they might be living um, in a long-term care home. And then we really focus uh, in the blue about all the different things we can be doing to better support people um, across the continuum. So in the bottom section, we talk about this idea of age-friendly communities and how we can really do things to support people to stay healthy and independent in their own homes and communities for as long as possible. Um, things that really can focus on that wellness and prevention for people to stay healthy and well. But then we start focusing on extra um, supports that we can provide in our home and community care settings. And then finally, 
things that we can do to provide excellent long-term care in long-term care home settings. And that's everything from how we build the homes themselves to how we also think about the care that we need to be providing in, in home-like in home -like settings to better support the needs of, of people as we age. So we can't think about as us or them or an either or approach. We need to think about long-term care across the continuum and how we can best meet the people people's needs where they're at um, and depending on, on what they will need to, um, uh, to have the best quality care possible. So this is actually a picture inside um, a, a real novel um, idea that's getting a little bit more attention in Canada, and it's the idea of a greenhouse model. Um, the Quebec government has actually announced that it's going to be spending a few billion dollars building new long-term care homes that actually are that are that look like these settings. So these are small home-like settings. They're usually in a. They look like they're a large house. They actually have 12 bedrooms in them, so single bedrooms. Each of the bedrooms has their own ensuite washroom, for example. And then these bedrooms surround a big common central area. So a big common room, um, but then also a big open kitchen with a big dining table. And so this is where everybody can gather and have their meals together, where they can socialize um, and they can be a part of the life of the home, cooking the meals um, with their caregivers and, and really meeting their needs. So this is kind of what a greenhouse model looks like. But greenhouses are not just the physical considerations. It's also how you actually staff and program the care that will be provided in these homes. And often family caregivers talk about how these are much more welcoming environments where they can be part of a small, tight-knit family. But these are also, as we think about design considerations, we also think about physical distancing considerations, which greenhouses do a good job because everybody has their own room if needed. Um, easy to clean services and furniture, thinking about how we eliminate those two, three, and four bedded room layouts, for example. We have these smaller footprints with common staff, um, so, um, so dedicated providers that know all the residents in that household really well. And always having that philosophy that first and foremost, these are homes. Um, these aren't facilities, these are not institutions. These are actually people's homes, and so that we need to make sure that we think of them as such always, first and foremost. So I also wanted to talk a little bit about the new national long-term care standards um, that we're helping to, um, to provide because family caregivers, especially in Ontario, and especially through the help of Family Council of Ontario, have really um, spent an incredible amount of time helping to inform the work that will be shaping the new national long-term care standards. And so right now, um, the Government of Canada has asked two organizations, um, Health Standards Organization and the CSA Group, to work collaboratively, collaboratively on developing two national standards for long-term care. HSO standard re really focus on um, the delivery of safe, reliable, and high-quality long-term care services, uh, while CSA is looking at kind of the design and operation um, of long-term care homes. And really what we think about is HSO's focus on the software, whereas CSA's focus on the hardware. So thinking about those two essential things that are integral to making sure that we can think about what long-term care needs to look like um, and what type of standards need to support them. In terms of HSO's new long-term care standards, um, right now it's focused on these four key areas. How do we provide resident-centered care practices? How do we focus on high-quality care? How do we think about a healthy and competent, resilient workforce? And how do we think about delivering strong governance practices and operations as well? And so this is the timeline that we've been working on in order to, um, to develop these. This is a work that started in March of 2021 um, and will be completed in December of this actual year. Um, and we've been on this 21 month timeline um, that really has been um, has been really enriched by the level of input that family caregivers, especially across Ontario, have provided throughout this entire process as well. And so when we think about the draft standard that was recently released for feedback and review, um, we know that these are the foundational principles that we're talking about when we think about high quality long-term care. We're talking about thinking about homes that are both homes and workplaces, where the conditions of work are the conditions of care. We often think about the provision of resident-centered care 
that thinks about adopting the perspectives of the residents to meet their needs and preferences um, with a supportive and relational approach. We want to make sure that that resident-centered care is evidence-informed, enables equity, diversity, inclusion, and cultural safety, and addresses systemic racism. And we also want to make sure that um, that we that we respect the rights of residents to choose to live with risk, um, but also when it won't negatively impact the safety of other long-term care residents in the workforce as well. And we also want to make sure that we better support um, our care by using continuous quality data collection and monitoring processes that support this, and then think about federal, provincial, and territorial legislation, regulations, and accountability that supports the provision of long-term care as well. You might say, well, what about family caregivers? Are they even factored into these new standards? They absolutely are. But what we really heard loud and clear from both family caregivers and residents is that we really need to make sure that we're not just talking over the heads of our residents to their family caregivers or to other staff members, that we really remember that long-term care homes are really built for the residents um, and family, and, and, and they will help to determine often who can be providing that support and care, um, and it's their right to direct the care that they want and how ha family caregivers need to be supported and thought about as members of the long-term care team. They're certainly not staff of the homes, but they certainly are people that need to be recognized for their contributions and supported. So for those of you who've seen the draft standard, we'll see how we really brought that voice and that role and the importance of family caregivers loud and clear and forward in the standards themselves. This is a little bit of a, a, um, of, of, um, of a, a guidance to the sections that'll inform the new um, HSO standard. So thinking about governance, thinking about resident-centered care, thinking about creating welcoming and safe home-like environments, thinking about the importance of residents' rights and high quality hair and quality of life, and also thinking about how do we also make sure that we have good coordinated care and integrated services, we have a strong and supported um, workforce, and that we're also promoting high quality um, care and quality improvement as well. So overall, we have choices and options. We have to remember that right now, when we have people waiting in hospital, waiting to go to a long-term care home or back to their own home, it costs our hospital system $750 a day. If people are living in a long-term care home, it costs about $200 a day. But we know home care for a long-term care equivalent person costs about $103 a day, but also requires um, engaged family caregivers um, and supported family caregivers who often end up providing the majority of the care for people who are high needs and need to and need and want to stay at home. And I often talk about Denmark and how they avoided building any new long-term care beds over two decades and actually saw the closure of thousands of hospital beds by strategically investing more in their home and community care services. Um, and this has been a challenge in terms of thinking about um, making sure that we continue to invest appropriately in our home and community care system. We know right now our government is committed in Ontario to building 30,000 new beds, um, but recognizing the value that home care can provide for so many and often having more home care can often allow family caregivers to still feel that it's a safe option and a reasonable option to keep their loved ones at home. This is where it led to a lot of advocacy before this election. Um, and especially with me being on CBC and on Marketplace, um, raising the issues that, that we have in home care that helped to lead the government to make a pledge of a billion dollars more to better improve our home and community care system after a few recent years of uh, underinvestment compared to previous governments. So that will certainly help more people stay at home, which is great, but we also need to think about how we need to improve long-term care across the entire continuum, both in people's own homes and also in people's, um, in long-term care homes as well. People often say to me, you know, you know, you know that, that people who need to be in long-term care homes, they can't be supported in their own homes. Well, again, you know, we've done a lot of work with our Ministry of Health where we've identified that there are often um, 
uh, long-term care equivalent people who are often living in their own homes um, and, and sometimes even staying and receiving all their care until they die. So we have to recognize the incredible work that family caregivers play in enabling so many people to stay at home, but how enabling that to occur means that we need to have more funded home care available as well. Because we know that right now, CAIHI, the Canadian Institutes of Health Information, tells us between 10 to 30% of people moving currently into our long-term care homes could probably be supported to stay at home if there was more adequate home and community care available. And right now, this is a diagram showing um, blue and purple bars. The blue bars represent the number of people who are 75 and older who are living in our long-term care homes across Ontario um, between 2007 and, and 2017. The purple bars represent um, people 75 and older who are long-term care equivalent. Their needs were deemed to be equivalent to those living in long-term care homes um, who are 75 and older. And you'll see that purple bar continually increased. And then by 2014, 15 started to surpass um, the blue bars. And that's showing that, that those investments that we started making under our Government of Ontario Senior Strategy back in 2012, 2013, started to see a significant increase in the number of older adults, about 30,000 more who are 75 and older who could stay in their own homes um, for, for longer because we had more home care available. We're hoping that the new billion dollar investment will support more people to stay in their own homes for as long as possible. But we also welcome those added investments to our long-term care homes that will hopefully allow um, higher quality of care to be provided in those environments as well. So finally, what's in store for long-term care in Canada? Well, I say that a conversation needs to begin at the federal, provincial, and territorial levels to determine how we should approach the future provision of long-term care and how best to enable aging in the right place for Canadians. National long-term care standards that I discussed uh, will be helpful to enable more of this. Um, and the government's also talked about creating a national aging well at home benefit um, as a strong enabler as well. And while long neglected, we know that the community support and home care sectors are more aligned uh, than ever with what older people want and will demand moving forward and require greater attention and investment. And we also know that promoting aging well will be one of the best things we can do to help many avoid the need for long term care um, as well. So I want to say thank you, and I think we have uh, at least 20 or so minutes um, uh, for questions. So I'm going to pass the baton back to, I believe, Sam, um, who will help uh, curate the uh, the next part of our uh, our session today. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sinha, for that great uh, talk. It's always a pleasure to listen uh, to you and uh, for really bringing forth a vision of what long-term care can be and looking at the spectrum of ways to support older adults or people who need care, what, regardless of where uh, they're based. So thank you very much. We have a few questions um, and um, moderator's prerogative. I'm going to start with one of mine. Um, so you mentioned addressing systemic racism. And I know this is a tough question to answer. But um, I mean, I've known for years that there's systemic racism in long-term care. We have a racialized, highly racialized workforce, um, women, uh, many newcomers in PSW roles. What can caregivers do? Um, what can family members do to address the systemic racism that's happening in our long-term care homes? Yeah, so it's an excellent question. And I think this is one of the challenges that when we think about systemic racism, I think it hits at all levels, right? It hits at the level of our of our workforce, as you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, um, usually a female workforce, um, very racialized as well. Um, and we also have to recognize that our, our resident population is evolving as well, mm -hmm. um, in becoming incredibly diverse. It's, again, a largely female resident population um, becoming more diverse as well. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that creates a challenge um, as well. And then again, and with those residents, they have their families as well. Mm -hmm. um, again, who might be of the same, you know, kind of race or gender or whatever the case is. So, so it's a complex setting to be involved in. And the first thing that we want to do is just raise awareness. Um, the idea that it's not acceptable um, and it cuts both ways because often we often hear about this disconnect between 
the residents and families and the caregivers. It could be different religions. It could mm -hmm. be different backgrounds. It could be just different understandings. Um, and how racism can actually um, start um, veering its ugly head in different ways, for example, um, and, and be really challenging, especially when so many residents living in long-term care settings might be living with dementia. Mm -hmm. So we, we sometimes hear horrible stories about uh, frontline workers who might be black, um, who um, are, are taunted and, 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 and people use racist memes or say things um, that they may have learned decades and decades ago was acceptable, um, but is no longer acceptable. But sadly, sometimes that dementia mm -hmm. that might actually be working on what we call the frontal part of the brain that makes us behave and, and not do inappropriate things might actually come out and actually might start creating um, um, you know, those awkward situations, for example. And it's really, really hard for staff to have to live through that and to provide care for that, especially when they may appreciate that that's not what that person um, means to say or truly would say if they had their cognitive wherewithal, but somehow that was deeply ingrained in them and still exists because it hurts when it's said. So I think it's just acknowledging, first of all, that we have very uh, a growing kind of um, um, diverse environments uh, of our workforces, our residents and our families, um, that it's really important to make sure that we take the time to acknowledge the diversity in our settings. Um, and one of the things that we did um, put out, um, my colleague, um, Dr. Ashley Flanagan, one of our research fellows at the NIA, put out an important paper um, a few months ago, talked about the importance of socio-demographic collection of data. Um, we talk about this with the residents, but we also talk about the staff, mm -hmm. getting to know who our, our residents and staff are. Because then when we start realizing, wow, you know, we have um, a number of people, say, who are Tamil, or a number of people who, um, you know, maybe from um, a certain part of Europe, for example, they might be Hungarian, they might be Latvian, whatever the case is, um, you know, you can think about race, but you can also think about culture, um, you can think about um, sexual orientation, there's so many different aspects of diversity, that when we start to understand who our staff are, who our residents are, it can then promote opportunities to actually share and learn about each other's cultures, are each other's perspectives um, and 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 create a much better living and working environment. Ones where again, it might create an opportunity, especially for example, if a home's work a home workforce might be a largely Filipino, for example, or might be uh, Afro Caribbean, for example, and that might not necessarily be the population of the residents. It might create an opportunity to learn more about those cultures as well, so one can better relate to the staff who are caring um, uh, for for their loved ones and and their families. But then also, it's an opportunity the other way around, where staff might say, "Wow, well, I'm working in a home that's that's uh, you know that that might have." Uh, folks who are, again, Latvian, Hungarian, I'm just making it up, but a, a, a good opportunity for them to understand um, the culture, the history of the people they're looking after. So often, um, you know, it's really important. I had a, I had a, one of my very close friends, um, she's, uh, uh, her family are originally from Barbados um, and, and they're Black. Um, and I remember when I had to help them with their long-term care journey, um, they ended up choosing a Latvian home uh uh for their for their loved one to live in and i remember having a conversation with her i said what's it like to be the only bajan or you know black you know person from barbados in living in a latvian home she said they were lovely they were great you know um you know i i was she said i was a bit worried um that there might be you know we might experience racism and that might just be a whole other issue on top of everything else or else we said no honestly we we chose that home because it's an excellent home they're providing excellent care and they didn't think twice they gave my dad the best care that he needed um and they didn't think of him differently and that was really really important to them um and it was really important for me because it was something i was thinking about that given that we know that there is so much systemic racism out there so that was a very long-winded answer but i know that you also gave me a complex question to kick this off um so hopefully that uh that was helpful very much so you touched on so many things the aspect you know intersectionality that uh, we are complex people residents staff caregivers uh we're not just white we're not just 
uh, Filipino. It's also Filipino Heritage Month. Uh, if anyone is curious about that, um, we we bring ourselves to to the care we give and receive and staff as well and also just the the complexity of uh, living with dementia and how that uh, folks may say things that they wouldn't ordinarily and it still hurts it's still harmful and uh, long-term care isn't like other settings where you can deny someone service staff need to be uh, providing that care so I think there is and also what you touched on is um, we're essentially living in a racist society society values whiteness um, as the standard uh, and that harms everyone so how as caregivers and staff everyone uh, we can we have a role to play so I think I hope that caregivers uh, take that away is that you can do something about systemic racism microaggressions overt racism in your long-term care home um, it's tough if we could solve racism we probably would have already but we all can uh, can do something about it. So complex question, good answer, thanks. There's a couple other questions that have come in um, from attendees. How can we encourage, and we being uh, caregivers um, who are already engaged in the system, how can we encourage greenhouse models or other social um, progressive models of care in Ontario? Most of the licenses, um, have been awarded to larger organizations, more of the traditional warehouse type um, setting. So what can be done? Yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's an excellent question because again, we know what the evidence is saying. You know, the evidence basically says that not-for-profit care uh, provision, you know, tends to be, you know, higher quality care, um, tends to have better outcomes. We also know that the greenhouse model um, the evidence keeps showing over time, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, that it is actually a superior uh, form of care. The idea of these small home-like settings where you have, you know, and it's not just about the setting, but it's also about the software, you know, appropriately staffing these um, as well. So right now in Quebec, they're really gung-ho on building these small like homes, but they're not necessarily planning to staff them appropriately as well. So I've already raised some caution about, okay, well, you know, you're building things that look like them, but are they going to be like them as well? So it's important to understand that, again, if you want to move to this sort of model, we have to incentivize that right now. Mm -hmm. I remember talking to the CEO of a large um, uh, for-profit mm -hmm. chain and talking to them about greenhouses. And they said, I'd love to do that. I really honestly would. But they said, we can't even think about that because the way the government of Ontario funds us to build long-term care homes it's to build those 32 unit um, um, formations, for example, at least 120 something beds um, per home, for example. Um, and you see these multiples and these new ones going up in parking lots of hospitals with 320 something beds. I remember recently when I was in Denmark um, uh, and, uh, and looking more closely at their long-term care uh, setting. I remember in this village, for example, I was saying, Okay, well, they said, I said, how many long-term care homes do you have? They said, well, we used to have four. We're now down to three um, because we have other alternative, you know, long-term care models we're providing in people's own homes or in an intermediary setting called what we call elder dwellings or supportive housing services. Uh, and and then and then when they were uh, and then when I was saying, well, how big are your long-term care homes? They said, uh, they said, oh well, the, we have some big ones. You know, our biggest one here is 40 beds, and I'm like big you know i don't think we have any long-term care homes that are that small or very few if any um and when i told them when we showed them a picture of our premier and from a brand new one that was 320 beds they were thinking they looked with horror they said well that looks like an institution that looks like a jail why would you build that so we do know the good news is is that we do know that that greenhouse models these small home like settings it's not just necessarily they have to be small homes. You can also, in, in a large setting, you can actually enact a greenhouse model in those settings as well. Small units of 12 single bedded rooms. But right now, the Government of Ontario funding system for those 30,000 beds is really about two people to a room or one person to a room. Um, it's in those large format settings. And I wish that they would do what Quebec was doing and actually provide a bit more funding or support or encouragement or permission so that you can even build smaller homes, for example, 
um, and, uh, and, and, and with this appropriate staffing as well. So I think it's important that we raise awareness about these models. Uh, family caregivers have an incredibly strong voice. Um, and I think knowing about these models, advocating well. And I can tell you our, our, our team at the National Institute on Aging is working right now this summer, we have some summer interns who are working on a report about the greenhouse model and what we can learn. Um, and we hope to share that um, in the fall. And maybe that can be a tool that FCO and others can also use um, uh, with other family caregivers um, to really advocate for a better model and what would that take to bring it to Canada um, and to a place like Ontario as well. Great. Yeah, you touched on an important point, which is we have these large long-term care homes that already exist and more are being built. Um, and we know that in many urban centers, land is at a premium. Toronto land is hard to come by, it's expensive. And so building up is often more cost effective, but how can you, and, and you pointed it out, have the best of, of both worlds. So that way we do have something that's still better than now, but is still putting capacity into the system. But staffing is, is key to everything. You have to have the right people doing, doing the work, doing the caregiving. Absolutely. So, how how can families be engaged in that advocacy at the provincial and federal levels? Do you have any suggestions for the particular mediums that are best for sharing ideas? Or really how can families use their important, powerful voices to impact policy decisions? Well, I think it's really important that again, when there are opportunities to engage, you know, with the federal and the provincial government, uh, when they're doing consultations, for example, when they're seeking that input, it's really important to kind of really get involved um, in those opportunities. I, I know that when I was asked to chair um, the development of the new national standards for HSO, I was really, really counting on family caregivers to step up and respond to our survey, our big national survey. We had 16,093 16, respondents. Um, we've had engaged now over 25,000 Canadians um, in all levels of our public review, our various surveys, our town halls, um, all of these sorts of things. Um, and a lot of that was actually, at least a third of that participation was from family caregivers, so thousands and thousands of caregivers. And even more recently, I know one of the hot button issues was um, the term uh, that we use for family caregivers in the standard. Um, a number of provinces have adopted the term designated support persons. And we heard loud and clear from so many family caregivers, they're like, we don't like that term. Mm -hmm. Yet the governments may have chosen them, and that's the term they like to use, but we don't like that term. We don't want to see that term in, in, in our national standard, for example. And so, again, if we didn't have people talking to us and engaging with us and telling us how they felt, for example, we wouldn't have that valuable input. So I remember um, I kept telling the, the chair of um, Health Standards Organization when I started this, I said, I need permission to go and engage with as many people as possible because it's not my standard, it's their standard. Um, and frankly, I know I'm going to have that moment with the Minister of Health and Minister of Seniors when they're going to want to hear from me how many people were engaged and I want to give them a big number so that they realize how many people were engaged and how many people are taking this seriously. So literally about two months ago, I was called for a last minute meeting with the Minister of Health, Minister of Seniors, who happened to be in Toronto down the street and said, could you meet and brief us on the standards? And I remember the moment there when I said to them, and we've engaged 25,000 Canadians in the Minister of Health, like, wow, you know, the Minister of Seniors already knew. And she's like, and she actually set me up for this by saying, how many people have we engaged so far, Dr. Sinesh? She said, you've done a pretty good job, haven't you? I'm like, 25, and I was like, you set me up. You already knew the answer. She's like, yeah, but he needed to hear that as well. Um, and because when, when, when a politician hears that there's that level of engagement, it's hard to actually deny what's actually, you know, when, when, when they know that citizens have participated, when residents, when family members, when frontline workers have really shaped the standard and it's their standard, then they know that this is something that they can get behind, for example. So, so that's a really good example of how 
that engagement of so many family. And I know it's kind of funny. We had to work a bit around the family caregivers of Ontario. I'll, I'll say it politely this way, because we had such an unprecedented level of engagement. We It started to actually say, well, wait a minute. Do we have enough family caregiver voices for Manitoba and that? Or do we have an Ontario-centric view? Mm -hmm. um, that's very shape. So that's where it actually forced us to work and get even more people um, so that we could make sure that we weren't missing other family caregiver voices from across Canada um, in these conversations. But that's a nice problem to have. That was not a bad problem. I just thought, wow, with such a great organization like FCO, it was able to rally because what we learned very quickly is there are not family councils in other parts of the country mm -hmm. uh, that are required. Um, there aren't family caregiver organizations. So that's why we relied on Sam uh, in particular to you know to help link us up to other family caregiving organizations that existed in Alberta and BC and other places so that we could make sure we engage as many family caregivers as possible. Great, thank you. Yes, they, I'm also pleased by the the volume of responses that you got because it is it's so important for caregivers to directly inform policy and participate in envisioning what the future looks like uh, because we, we, my, my parents, other people in my life are the residents of the future. So we have to start now and plan for what is going to be best uh, to come. Last question, uh, just we're running out of time. You mentioned evidence and the need for evidence informed um, decisions to be made. What emerging topics are on the radar for long-term care advocates and professionals that might lead to new research in the next few years? Where are the gaps? What do we need to know more about? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and I think one of the things that really, I think, caught people off guard was we've done so much work about thinking about residents in long-term care settings and kind of doing research and, and, and learning and writing around their needs. We've done, there's been a great amount of work that people like Pat Armstrong, Carol Esterbrooks have done that have really focused on the workforce. Um, but often, you know, I don't think there was much um, work done thinking about family caregivers in long-term care settings. Like it was just, uh, the literature wasn't really that robust or strong. And I think most people didn't even know that they existed until we locked them all out um, at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and then I think that really spurred a whole recognition like oh gosh we didn't even know you were here because we know how many residents there are we might even know how many workers there are but we never necessarily done a head count of family caregivers um, we never really defined who they were what their roles were what do we do during an outbreak or during a pandemic and so i think a lot of that really spurred a lot of research that was now happening around the role of family caregivers in long-term care settings a lot of rapid learning um, and it was great to see dedicated funding um, that came around that. I know, um, Sam, you uh, have participated in FCO and brought in um, family caregivers to be a part of um, some of the research that we've done that's been sponsored by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research um, and a number of family caregiving research projects that have happened. So I actually think the field is wide open right now because I think we're literally still just going like, oh, these people exist. Okay, well, like, well, do, I think we should start measuring how many people are there. I think we should start quantifying how much care they're often providing, because these are still questions that I don't even know if we have the answer to. How many family mm -hmm. caregivers do we have in long-term care settings across Canada? I don't know what the number is. Um, you know, how much care are they providing that's unfunded mm -hmm. and, and hidden? I don't know what the number is. So there's a huge number of very basic questions uh, but a whole area of research that can open up. So all I would say is uh, for those of you who are engaged and listening to a presentation like this, um, usually now people know about FCO, um, they know Sam, um, and they'll come and say, hey, Sam, we need family caregivers. Um, and then Sam has to go out and find people. Well, you know, if you're interested and you're willing, getting engaged in those research opportunities allow you to participate and be a part of the important research that needs to be conducted. Um, so I would just say, please get engaged. Um, and often by getting engaged, you can shape the questions that are sometimes being asked um, and the quality of the research that's being conducted as well. Great, thanks so much. I will say that um, FCO, we do have a, um, a list, a roster of people who have indicated they're willing to talk to government, media, and researchers. So we'll be putting out another call for that uh, sometime soon. So if you're newer 
to our work, you can uh, sign up there. It just gives us a, a quick and easy way uh, to identify people who are interested in that. Sometimes those turnaround times are quite short, uh, so the more we can prepare, uh, the better to make sure those caregiver voices are, are heard in that. So we are now at 2 o'clock. The hour has flown by. Uh, Dr. Sinna, thank you so much for spending the time with us today, for sharing your vision of the future of long-term care and answering the questions from attendees. As we come to a close today, I just want to say on behalf of FCO, all of our attendees, uh, we deeply appreciate the time you spent today sharing your passion, your wisdom, and your insights. We all have much to reflect on about how to prepare for the future. What's the role of caregivers? How do we quantify that? How do we, um, how do we know what it is? And how can we make care and physical environment changes to ensure high quality long-term care now and for the residents of tomorrow? So Dr. Sinha, a big uh, thank you again uh, for your, your passion, your time and your insights. My pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. And to those of you who've turned in, tuned in today, I hope to see you tomorrow. That's Tuesday, June 14th for our day of learning. We're going to be getting uh, started at, I believe, 1 p.m. We're going to have some icebreaker opportunities, some you know chance to get to know each other, a little bit of that regrouping piece of our theme. And we will have uh, some wonderful opportunities to, to learn uh, communication in long-term care, the role of social work, uh, and our FCO's very own Kathleen Edwards will be premiering our newest educational module on hybrid councils, because that, we believe, is part of the future of family councils. How do we mix in-person and online meetings for success? You'll definitely want to join us for that one to learn from, from FCO's Kathleen Edwards. In the meantime, though, thank you so much for joining us today. Happy Seniors Month. A big thank you to my team behind the scenes for making this happen. And we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks so much, everyone.